that's impressive. Yeah, so the first thing, uh, we have the same guy. Well, good evening, church. Welcome to our Sunday evening service. Trust everyone had a good, restful afternoon. Wasn't morning service just wonderful today? Between Sunday school, we had a great Sunday school class, and then great service this morning to hear Brother Larry and Sister Barb deliver a special. That's telling Brother Larry through it all. When a man stands up who has been through it all and can still stand, all these years and continue to praise the Lord. What an encouragement that is to me. What a blessing that is to me. So thank you, Larry. Thank you, Sister Barb, for playing both services today. Praise God. So we're never too old where we can't serve the Lord, right, and offer back the gifts and the talents he's given us. So thank you. Well, I bet you're glad you're, if you're not glad, you will be glad you came tonight. And I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to open our service in prayer. And William is going to come and lead us in some of these great hymns of the faith following our prayer. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight for the nice sunshine outside and the safe and warm place that we have this evening. Father, may your, your spirit be very evident here tonight. Lord, speak to us. Challenge us through your word as we sing these songs even though they may be familiar or may be unfamiliar, Lord, help us to concentrate on the words that we're singing tonight, the message that is, is captured in, in what we're singing back to you, the doctrine that's there. May it encourage us and uh, help us, and may you be pleased by what you hear. And Lord, as Pastor Bill brings the message tonight, again, may that be pleasing to you, but ultimately, may it be helpful for us Help us to leave here differently than we arrived tonight. As we look at applications, may we make the decision to truly apply them to our lives tonight and tomorrow and going forward. Father, we love you. Thank you for the amazing things that you do in our midst. We'll give you the glory and the praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Will. Our first song shouldn't be that hard to find. It's the very first one in your hymnal, hymn number one, My Savior's Love. Charles Gabriel, the writer of this hymn, wrote over 7,000 hymns in his life. Uh, a lot of them we still sing, such as uh, His Eye is on the Sparrow and Crown Him with Many Crowns, and this hymn right here. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How love for me 
for me. It was in the garden. He prayed not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. shall see twill be my joy through the ages his sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my sing seated. This next hymn is not in your hymnals, but it will be up on the screen. How deep the Father's love for us. Oh, 
Turn to page 386 in your hymnals or up on the screen. Praise him, all ye little children. Praise him, praise him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Praise him. Brother Lowe, would you please pray for the offering? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come at this time. And we give thanks and praise for the opportunity to come to your house and worship you tonight, Lord. And now as we go through the process of giving back, Lord, what you've given us, we ask that you bless the offering and use it for the furtherance of your gospel. Here's the preaching of your word tonight. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Good evening. We have switched around the sermon series from morning to evening, and so we were going to talk about missions in the evening this month and Solomon in the morning, but we decided to flip that. Uh, I, I have to take credit for that. I decided to flip that. In case you don't like it, it's me, not anybody else. I got excited to preach about missions this morning, and so we, we preached about missions this morning. But this evening, we're going to look at the life of Solomon once again. We're going to look at the life of Solomon once again. And so we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 3. If you have your Bible with you, I want to encourage you to follow along with me. 1 Kings chapter 3. I remember as, as kids, I remember as, as kids at different times when people would say, you know, if you, if you won the lottery, what would, you, what would you spend all the money on? Well, of course, I was a kid and I didn't play the lottery, but I sure had a lot of ways that I thought I could spend the money. Or my friends and I would sit around and they, we would say, if you could have any superhero power, what would you have? And we'd talk about our favorite comic book characters and that. And we would, we would sort of imagine. But let me ask you a question that was actually asked of a man. If God approached you and asked you to name a blessing and he would give you that blessing, what would you ask for? What would you ask for? God wants to bless us. I think oftentimes we don't believe that. I think we, we think that God is cheap and he doesn't want to give it out or he wants to give it out. He just doesn't want to give it out to us because we haven't been good enough that day. We haven't uh, done all the right things and we, we put some list in our mind. But I want you to know that God is eager to bless us and he was eager to bless Solomon. I think that if we were posed with that question, we might be tempted to ask for some of the things that would make our lives easier or might make our lives more enjoyable or we might use to help other people. 
Uh, I, I think that sometimes we ask not at all, or that we might ask for lesser things when we come into the presence of the Lord. Solomon's reign was different than David, his father. Solomon's reign was characterized by peace, where David's reign was characterized by warfare, but victory in that warfare. Solomon was going to be a man of peace, and his reign would be known for its prosperity, for the wealth that he would have, for the joy of the servants in his household. How did that happen? How did that happen? God did approach Solomon and said, ask what it is you would have. Name a blessing. And what Solomon asked for greatly pleased the Lord. And so let's see what he did ask. And he doesn't just hold the answer in the word of God tonight as we come in here, but it also gives us the entire account of his interaction with the Lord. And so we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 2. The word of God says in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 2, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built under the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked for riches for thyself, nor hast asked for the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast asked not, not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Let's pray together. Father, as we look to your word, I pray that you'd open it to us. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for the promise of your spirit. And may it meet the needs that we have tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. David has died. Great King David, who started out as a shepherd, a, a simple man singing songs out perhaps in the, the starlight to the sheep that he was set to watch over as a young lad. God took him and raised him up. He became the sweet psalmist of Israel, writing uh, the inspired words that we have in many of the psalms. He became a great warrior who defeated Goliath and put many of Israel's enemies uh, to, to flee. And he also was a great king. And his time is over. And now his son Solomon reigns in his stead. And this was before Solomon did that great work of building a temple, a, a house for the Lord. And it says in verse number 2 in 2 Kings 3, it says, Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built under the name of the Lord until those days. So people would go to 
hills or mountains or tall places, perhaps to be near uh, the heavens, perhaps to be near the sun, the moon, the stars. And this was not just God's people. All sorts of people would use the high places in the Old Testament in order to make sacrifices to whatever God they happened to worship. For the majority of the people around the children of Israel, that was to pagan gods. In fact, uh, archaeologists have looked at some of those places and how they became more and more ornate after times, and they know without a doubt that even human sacrifices, that of children, were made at some of these high places. And so what happened was, instead of uh, offerings and worship being done in the tabernacle, as God had commanded the children of Israel from the time of, of Moses onward, before the temple was built, the sacrifices were to be done there, but they weren't being done, done there. This was a good time in the kingdom. God's blessing had been brought in there, much godliness in the kingdom. But the people still allowed this pagan culture to creep into their worship. It says in verse number three, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. It says Solomon loved the Lord. What a, what a testimony that is. What do you want said about you? When your days here are done, what do you want engraved, perhaps, on your tombstone? If the Lord tarries his coming, we'll all enter into the presence of the Lord through the doorway of death. I hope you're ready for that day, that you know Christ as Savior, that you have no doubt in your hearts about it. But we're all going to stand before the Lord. What will they say about me? I don't oftentimes dwell on my passing, but I have been encouraged by other people, other preachers even, to think about that day and what you want that day to be like and back up until this day and figure out everything you need to do so that when you pass it's the way that you want to the right relationship with your spouse with your family the right relationship with the lord the right entrance into heaven for the things that you set up uh, sent ahead of time investing in the things of eternity what a great testimony it would be to love the lord and i do believe that solomon in his heart was sincere about his worship he wanted to worship the, the Lord, the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not these other pagan gods that were around him. But it brought up this same thing again, that even Solomon offered sacrifice in the high places. Now, this is a little bit weird right now. Is from, if you look at uh, the scriptures, we won't go into a huge study of it, but it seems that the tabernacle was set up near a place called Gibeon during this time but that the Ark of the Covenant had been removed from it and was somewhere near Jerusalem at this time. And even though they were in two different places, it says that they were going up to the high places to sacrifice. What, what do we look at this? This is the culture, the worldly influences of the worldly pagan religions around them seeping into the children of God. And the idea of worldly worship is not unfamiliar to us today. There's lots of carnal things that go on inside of churches that are designed to appeal to man's emotion, that are designed to whip people up into some sort of religi religious frenzy that exalt the person who is singing or perhaps playing instead of to exalt the Lord that they're supposed to be singing about and playing about. So this is, this is not uh, an unheard of thing in our day. What I, what I love about this passage that we said, it says that Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of David, his father. I love it when people have a father that they can look to and say, he's the one who followed the Lord. That, that was David's testimony, that he walked, Solomon walked in the ways of David, which meant that he did the right thing. What a heritage to have if your father is walking in the way of righteousness. That's a blessing. Not everybody has that. And if you have been given that, if you have a godly uh, father, a godly mother, if you have a goodly heritage, as the Bible says, if you have that, rejoice in it. Because there are many people that inherited trust funds, that inherited a comfortable living and family wealth, and maybe even the prosperity of this world because they got set up on a good playing field. All of that pales in comparison to having a godly father or a godly mother show you the way to walk. And David had that. I love it when dads and moms leave, live and leave a godly pattern. And so he offers, it says, incense and burnt offerings in the high places. Look in verse 4. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. 
So he goes to Gibeon, where most likely the tabernacle is set up at this time, and he goes there to the great high place. This isn't just any old place. This is the great high place. And he offers a thousand burnt offerings. First of all, how many of you are familiar that there's a certain way that the offerings are to be made in the Old Testament? How many of you know that there's a certain way? You can't just go up there and do whatever you want. There was a certain way that the animal had to be handled, and after it was killed, it had to have certain things parted and this removed and this burnt and all. How long do you think a thousand cattle or sheep, or how, how long do you think that took? That took a long time. By the way, I want you to know that's how wealth was measured in the Old Testament time. Today, you might talk about your stock portfolio. You might look at what cars you drive or where your house is located or how many uh, bedrooms and bathrooms are in it. You might look at your bank account. But you know what it was in the Old Testament? What, what, what did your cattle look like? H how many, how many uh, fields did you have that you harvested from? So when Solomon gave a thousand burnt offerings, I want you to know that was a lavish gift that he brought before the Lord. That was not a normal thing. That was not a normal thing. This was something way above and beyond, and he gave it because of his great love for the Lord. In addition to people who leave a great legacy, I love people that love worshiping God. People that worship God and they give, and they give generously because God means that much to them. Because God means that much to them. And that's what Solomon did. And it says that that he actually was spoken to in a dream after he offered all of those sacrifices. It says in verse 5, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Now, in case you're wondering, there are other times when God has appeared in dreams, especially in the Old Testament. Jacob saw the Lord, and Abraham saw the Lord and, and in dreams. And we know in the New Testament, Joseph had a dream where he was spoken to by the messenger of the Lord. There, there are times when these things happen. So this isn't the most unusual thing in the world. And God was actually speaking to him. And this was more than just a normal dream. It was the Lord. So don't think that every dream you have is something that God is uh, speaking to you through. You could have just eaten something you shouldn't have eaten before bed and had some sort of weird dream. At the same time, I'm not saying that God will never communicate with you through this way, but here's what I can say, that if the, you think the Spirit of God has spoken to you through some sort of dream or vision or impression, it will never contradict the Word of God. The Spirit of God's leading will never contradict the Word of God. Lots of people have gotten in lots of trouble because they say, I had a vision, I had a dream. God spoke to me and he told me this thing, except the thing that they heard was against the word of God. God, there, there, there's no disagreement among the Trinity. And so the spirit of God is not going to say anything different than what God the Father wanted in his word and has put in his word. So measure everything by the Bible. So God offers Solomon a blessing and it's his choice. Whatever you want, ask what it is and I'll give you. In verse 6, Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. You know, he took time to worship the Lord. Even though God came to him in a vision, and even though even God said, What is it that you want? He took time to rehearse God's goodness. He took time to realize the mercy that he had been shown. Remember, David was not a perfect man. David was not a perfect man. Solomon, as we see and will see in the future, was not a perfect man. And yet they still enjoyed God's mercy. God didn't come down upon them and visit every iniquity upon them. He showed great grace and mercy. And Solomon lifted that up when he spoke with the Lord. Verse number seven. And now, O Lord, my God... Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or come in. He said, I want you to, to <laughs> I want to recognize first here that I honestly don't know what I'm doing. You ever had God bring you to a place where you realize you had no idea what you were doing? Oftentimes we pretend like we know what we're doing, but God is not fooled. God is not fooled. And Solomon looked at his father and everything that his father had accomplished, 
All of the wars that he fought and won, all of the times when he was persecuted by people who should have been supporting him, and he stayed faithful to God, even when he sinned against God, he humbled himself and returned to the Lord, confessing his sin. We have that saved for us in Psalm 51. He looks at everything that he did, and he's like, now I'm supposed to be king. He says, now I'm the king in the place of David, my father. And he says, I am but a little child. Now, this doesn't mean that Solomon was five years old. What this means is that he did not feel up to the task at all. He was supposed to reign and rule, but he didn't feel up to the task. And remember, this wasn't in front of people where he was putting on some sort of humble show in order for everyone to think, wow, look how pious he is. This is just between him and the Lord and his dreams. And he says, I know not how to go out or come in. Say, what's he talking about? He said, the comings and goings, the, the normal rhythms of life, the things that you have to do day in and day out in order to make it through the day, the necessities of life. He said, I don't know how to do that. He says, I do not know how to do what you've asked me to do. You have put me in this place. God was the one who decided that Solomon would be king after David. And now he's faced with that, all of this. And he's trying. He's trying. As we see, he's not getting everything right because of the problem with the high places. We understand that. And he says, I don't know what to do. Verse number eight. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. What a different way of thinking. He said, the people that I'm ruling over are your people, God, not my people. What a different way of thinking than the earthly kings who might talk about their kingdom and their people and their project. No, he recognized that what he had was given to him of God, and he is just stewarding them. Not just kingdoms and kings are stewarding for God. All of us that know Christ as Savior, the things that we have been entrusted with, we are simply stewards or managers over them. We don't own them. We have them for a time, whether that's the possessions that are in our hands or even the children and grandchildren that are given to us. They're not ours to keep. They're ours for a time, and we train them up to serve the Lord in the way that they ought to go, and we commend them unto the Lord, knowing that they're going to have to walk after him on their own. How very unkingly of him to recognize that it's God's people. And he says, and your people are so great, and there's so many of them, and this is so important, I can't bear to mess this up. So what does he ask for? Verse 9, give therefore... Because it's such a great job, because it's such a great task, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. You know what he asks for? An understanding heart. He wants to know how to make the right decisions. When he's presented with all of the decisions that are lying before him on a daily basis, he wants to know what he's supposed to do. How many of you have ever gone to God and said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with this? You're perplexed. There's too many moving pieces. There's not enough resources to take care of it. You can't see far enough into the future to know which way is right and which way is wrong. And so how do I please you? And so he says, you know what I want? I want an understanding heart. So I know how to make the right choices. And he says here at the end, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. He said, your people are so precious and there's so many of them. Who's able to make the right judgments? Who's able to govern over them? Who's able to lead them if you don't help me? Verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord. God was happy with what he asked for. God was very happy. What, what would you have asked for? Now, many of us already know this story. And so we're going to say, I would have asked for wisdom. But that's because we know the answer to the test. That's because we know the answer to the test. I want you to honestly think, if God asked you for anything, would it have been something this selfless? I fear that I may not have asked for something this selfless. Maybe even it would have been for the good of the kingdom and not just the good of myself. But he, he, he didn't ask for anything for himself. He wanted to be able to serve the Lord better. You see, this prayer, this request pleased God. This is what it means to pray in the will of the Lord. This is what it means to pray in the will of the Lord, to ask for the things that please God. When you pray, I want to encourage you, pray the promises of God. 
Look at what God promises in Scripture and base your prayers off of those things. Why? Because you already know that God wants them. It's very hard to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to ask for things if you don't know that that's actually what Jesus would want. If you don't think he would put his seal of approval, his stamp on it, can we really say that we're praying in the name of Jesus? Just by adding his name to our personal wish list is not the same thing as praying in the will of God. And so here, Jesus, or excuse me, Solomon, getting off topic there, Solomon asked for what would please the Lord. You can never go wrong when you ask yourself the question, what will please God here? You can never go wrong with that. What will please God in this situation? Pastor Steve will oftentimes say it like this, how can I honor the Lord in this? How can I honor the Lord in this? That is a great place to be. You're going to run into something this week. I don't know what it is. I'm not cursing you with it either. It was already coming. You're going to run into something this week, and you're going to say, Ugh, I wish this didn't happen. I wish we weren't here. I wish this person hadn't said this, done this. I wish I didn't get sick. Uh, I wish that there was more dollars in the bank for this thing. I wish that my health was different. I wish that my attitude, I wish that that person's attitude was different. There's going to be something that comes up, and you may have a moment of spiritual clarity where you ask this question, how can I please the Lord in this? And if you ask that question and you know what would please the Lord and you go with that, you're going to find yourself in a good place afterwards. You're going to find yourself in a very good place afterwards. You know, Solomon could have asked other things and even the Lord recognized that. It says in verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies. He, he could have asked for those things, right? He could have said, Lord, I want to live for hundreds of years, or at least as long as you'll allow me. He could have said, I want to be the richest king that ever ruled anywhere in the world. He could have said, I, I want to be, I want all of my enemies to just be crushed so that I, I never have anything to threaten me. But instead, as God notes there, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. He said, I did it. Because you didn't ask for something fleshly, because you didn't waste your opportunity on yourself, but asked that which would please the Lord, I have answered your prayer. You could have asked these things, but you didn't. And that's what pleased the Lord about it. He says, I've given it to you, but not just that. Not just that. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like thee all thy days. He didn't just get what he asked for. He got more than what he asked for. How? He asked for the thing that pleased the Lord. He asked for the thing that pleased the Lord. He's going to get the blessings as well. He says in verse 14, And thou wilt walk, and if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. He says, if you walk in the right path, if you go in the right direction, then not only you get these blessings, but you're going to get to enjoy them for a long time because I'm going to give you long life. And how did, did God refer to it? As the way that thy father David did walk. You know what encourages me about all this? Again, David was not a perfect man. David sinned. In fact, David sinned grievously, didn't he? And yet, even though he had sinned grievously, he repented of it, returned to the Lord, and the Lord still considers his conduct to be described like this. As thy father David did walk. I want you to know that God has factored into his whole plan for the world and for our frailty, he has factored in that you and I will sin. I don't understand how he knows all of that because that is, that is a decision that you and I make. Not a decision he makes, but he is so great, he knows even that. Do you know how I know he, he made room for that? Because in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, it says, if we confess our sin, written to believers, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, it says if we say that we don't have any sin, the truth is not in us. If we pretend that we're not going to mess up or that we'll never mess up, if we pretend to be perfect in this world, that, then, then we're lying. Because Jesus went to great lengths, not just to forgive the sin that we did before we were saved, but all of our sin. Remember, all of our sin was in the future when Jesus paid for it. All of it was in the future. And so God, understanding our frailty, even made room for that. And yet, you can still, even if you've had some sort of failing in your life, but you've dealt with that failing according to God's word. There may be earthly consequences, certain doors may be shut to you, but I want you to know, you can still walk after the Lord and please him. We serve a God of many chances. We serve a God of great mercy. Well, in verse 15, Solomon wakes up. Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. He was so thrilled by his encounter with God and what God said, more offerings, more worship, more thanksgiving, and he blessed all of his servants with a great feast when he got back from Gibeon, back to Jerusalem. So, so what do we do with this season of his life? This, again, is another wonderful part of his life. But it, it's not all a wonderful part. But before we get there, and we will get there, let's look at some applications for today. Beware worldly worship. Beware worldly worship. The culture wants to try and dictate by how they worship, by how they pursue after their gods, little g, whether that is actual the gods of false religion or whether that perhaps is money or pleasure or comfort or education or the approval of others, whatever they turn to and they say, this will give me life and this will give me comfort and this will give me protection, that is an idol. That is a god, little g, that the world looks at and there's, it's very easy for that to slip into how God's people think. We are in this world, but we are not to be of this world. Carnal worship, worship that draws attention to man instead of to God, is worldly. So you ask yourself, is, is this about a certain instrument or a certain style of worship? Is that what this is about? No. God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Uh, I had to have this conversation uh, when, when we were in India with some of the people that were over there. I don't know if they were trying to, to be a blessing to, to me, or if they normally sing like this, but um, the whole church service, the evening that I was preaching in the Ukrul Baptist Church, that was all in Tonkal, except for when I was preaching and they translated it into Tonkal, or when this young lady got up and sang a song. And it was a, a popular song by Hillsong, right? A contemporary song. And she sang her heart out. She really did. She tried her best which must be hard because that's not her native language. And so the next day, when I had an opportunity to sit down with the faculty and the staff and, and talk with the people in the church, I started to talk with them about what worship needs to look like. We're not going to go into all of it tonight, but in John chapter 4, when Jesus meets the woman at the well, he speaks to her and says, God is a spirit and he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. First of all, truth is communicated through words. Truth is communicated through words, and so therefore it's important what the words say in your songs. How many of you think it's okay for me to preach something that's not true? No hands? It's not okay, right. How many of you think it's okay to sing something that's not true? Well, it's not. So it needs to, of course, be true. But people also need to understand what it is that you're saying so that they can be blessed by the truth of it, and God can be worshipped by the truth of it. And when she sang in English, you know how many people understood what she was doing in that church? No one understood what was going on, but maybe a few of the college students that attend there and also understand English, right? So it needs to be in a language that they can be blessed by the truth, that they can be taught. Remember, one of the best things about singing good music is that you learn doctrine by the music being sung. Some of you have experienced what I've experienced when you're in a bad place and you can't think of a Bible verse, but you can think of a hymn. You can think of a song, and the song inside of it has the Bible truth that you need for that moment. So it's got to be deep in truth. And if you had a question in your mind, do I want a lot of truth in my singing or just a little bit of truth in my singing? Well, that's a pretty easy choice, isn't it? 
You want a lot. You want a lot, not a little. So when you're looking at the songs that you're singing, one of the reasons why I love the hymns of the faith, as opposed to something that may be palatable but shallow, is that it's filled with doctrinal truth. And it's something that gets ingrained in your heart and mind as you sing it over and over again. I want you to know the reason that we have hymns and gospel choruses in our church is the way that we sing unto the Lord and encourage one another is not because we don't know any better. It's not because we've always done it that way. It's because it is a far better choice than other options that might be out there because of the truth, but not only because of the truth, but God must be worshiped in spirit and in truth. God made us more than just the flesh and bones that we see, more than just the impulses. There is a part of you that will live forever, either in heaven with the Lord because you've trusted Christ as Savior and your sins have been forgiven, or, or in heaven, or in hell, separated from God in a place of torment. Part of you will last forever. The body is not all that's here. We're described as spirit, soul, and body. And so to appeal to the flesh, to appeal to the carnality, and how many of you know that there's music that appeals to the flesh? How many of you are aware of that? If you don't agree with me, I can probably, I can probably make you agree with me by playing certain songs, right? If I had Dave up there ready to play the Eye of the Tiger right now, I bet you I could pump some of you up. Not because of the words, but because of the, the, the music behind it, right? You could, you could play certain themes that might make you sad or might make you energetic. There's even music that can make you afraid. Music can go slip right past the mind and go straight to the emotions. But we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. Not even just in soul and in truth or in body and in truth, but in spirit and in truth. Emotion is fine, but that ought not be the target. And there's a lot of cheap worship going on that is not actual worship. It's an emotional occurrence that people have. I told a story about my friend Tom. He's one of the few people that I knew from high school that got saved and, and is still serving the Lord. A lot of my friends from high school are not believers, but he is. And he used to go to a, a, a local church here that was a non-denominational church with a, a, a very uh, smoke and laser-filled worship style right? He described, and they describe it like this, I don't, as a happy, clappy church, whatever that means, okay? And then I, I said, so how, I ran into him, and I'm like, hey, so how are things going? You still in church? He's like, yeah, but I'm in a different church now. He goes to some small Bible church out by where he lives now, and I'm like, you changed churches, did you? He's like, yeah, I realized I needed more than a rock concert on Sunday mornings to grow in my relationship with God. And I'm like, wow, amen, Amen. I was encouraged by that. You see, it, it's, it's not, it's deeper than, oh, that instrument is worldly. It's deeper than that. It's about how we worship the Lord. The problem is the, the world wants to try and dictate how we worship. By the way, did you know that people who don't know Christ as Savior are spiritually dead? It says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins before we were given new life. We were born again. So if God's going to be worshipped, and is this a worship service? The answer is yes. Did you know that unsaved people can't worship the Lord? So why would you tailor your music to unsaved people and play it during the worship time in your church? That doesn't make any sense. Now, churches will do all sorts of things to bring in crowds and a good intention to try and, and hook them on their music and on their environments and on the fact that they have something three times larger than the McDonald's playland, the play area inside of their children's. They try and hook them on it, but I want you to know that they're making a mistake. They're making a mistake. Whatever you hook people with is what you have to keep them. And if you hook them with fleshliness and carnality, you have to keep them with it. And that can turn very sour very quickly. So beware of worldly worship. Don't let it seep its way into our church or into your life. Second of all, we should ask God for wisdom. We should ask God for wisdom. Solomon could have had anything, and he asked for an understanding heart. He asked for discernment. Why? Why did God want to give him that? Why was God so pleased with that? Would you look in Proverbs briefly? In Proverbs 4. In Proverbs 4, 
Look at what the Word of God says. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Do you know why? Because this is the thing to ask for. This is it. God says this is the principal thing. No doubt Solomon was connected in the writing of Proverbs and he experienced it for himself. Of course, we know that the author is the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, if you got to know, if you want to ask for something, ask for this. You say, what would be the best thing for me to have in this circumstance? Without a doubt, get wisdom. Get wisdom. Ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. This is, this is somewhat surprising. Look in James, would you? You know how I always thought I had to get wisdom? By studying a lot. I thought that if I studied a lot, I would get wisdom. And then I met some people that were very well studied, but they weren't very wise. How many of you know a smart person that's not actually a wise person? Don't point, okay? <laughs> Please don't point. But look in James 1, verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know why? Because God loves to give people wisdom. He loves to take the simple, which is God's word for people without wisdom, and to make them wise. He loves that. And one of the best ways for you to get there is the way that Solomon got there, through humility. Through admitting, I have no idea what to do. Lord, you're going to have to do something. Oftentimes we muddle through and we do it in our own strength and we never ask God for wisdom. And then we get to the other end of it and we think, boy, I should have gone to God with this first. I kind of made a mess. Maybe more than kind of. I did make a mess. God says that is the principal thing. And if Solomon's life teaches us anything, godly wisdom is perhaps the best thing that you and I could ask him for. And the good news is if we ask, he gives it to us. He gives it to us. Finally, let's seek to please the Lord. Let's seek to please the Lord. Solomon worshipped God, he humbled himself, and he asked for something that God loved because he loved the things that God loved. God loved his people, they were precious to him. Solomon loved his people, they were precious to him. He wanted to lead his people right, God wanted his people led right. He wanted, God wanted good decisions made, so Solomon said, give me what I need to make good decisions. Solomon worshipped God. God and he asked for the things that God loved and you know what he got all the other stuff too it's almost like he sought first what God loved God's kingdom and all the other things were added unto him boy that sounds familiar Matthew 6 Matthew 6 verse 31 through 33 right therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for after all these things do the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of these things but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you boy isn't that interesting it's almost like those things might be connected look in proverbs 16 would you and then We'll close for the evening in Proverbs 16. You know what happens when you seek to please the Lord? Not only does he give you the thing that you asked for, but it says in Proverbs 16 and verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. You say, I want my enemy to be at peace with me. Lord, that's what I'm asking for. Well, perhaps we should start a step back and say, God, grant me wisdom. Help me to love the things that you love. Help me to, to do the things that would please you, the things that would honor you. And then all of those things come along with it. All of those things come along with it. We seek to please God, and everything else will follow. Beware worldly worship. Ask God for wisdom, and seek to please the Lord. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. 
Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment? We have in our church a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that the Lord has spoken to you about. And I don't know what God is speaking to you about, but let me ask you this question. Do you feel like a little child? Do you feel like you don't know what the next step is? Do you feel like you don't know how to handle a situation? Maybe you've been brought to a place where you feel like you're at wit's end, and you say, I don't know what to do. I have great news for you. God knows exactly what to do. Not only does he know what to do, but he wants you to know what to do. You say, Lord, I need wisdom for this. Amen, that's the right prayer. That's the right prayer. I need wisdom. Even better news, he promises to give it if we ask. And not just a little bit, not just sparingly, but liberally, generously. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around tonight, I just want to pray for you. How many of you need wisdom, God's wisdom about something? Would you just slip your hand up and write back down? I just want to pray for you. I need God's wisdom. Amen. Hands all over. Me too. I need God's wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you. Has a worldly way of thinking, perhaps even a worldly way of worship, crept into your mind and your heart? Have the things of this world taken a greater hold on you than they ought to have? Have they started to affect your relationship with God? If they have, I want you to know that it doesn't always have to be like that. Solomon is going to make some good decisions here very soon. He's going to build the Lord, uh, his rightful dwelling place, and after he does that, he's going to get right with this area in his life. You can get right with that area in your life, that worldliness, that carnality that's uh, that's crept in. You don't have to keep it there. God will help you to have victory over it. Is there someone who would say, Lord, help me. I need need this crowded out of my life. I need this removed. I need this helped. And I don't know what to do about it, but I believe you can help me. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you? Lord, help. There's something in there. Amen. Thank you. I see your hand. Anybody else say, Lord, help me in this? Amen. This carnal way of thinking has slipped in. Amen. Thank you. Put your hands down. I appreciate that. How many of you have been perhaps trying to please yourself or please your spouse or please your children or please your boss, even please your pastor? (laughs) And you say, Lord, helping me. I've seen now I, I need to make my ways please the Lord. Maybe you've been going after one of the byproducts instead of the Lord himself. And you say, Lord, helping me. I'm going to seek to please him. Would you just slip your hand up and write back down? I'm going to seek to please the Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. I'm going to seek to please the Lord in this. I've been going after the secondary thing. Let me get to the root of it. I'm going to seek to please the Lord. Amen. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as Savior, I want you to know that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. You can come into God's presence. You can have his wisdom, but not before your sins are forgiven, not before you're born again. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And you can slip out of your seat and come and let me know and say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. And someone will take the Bible and show you from God's word how you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven. A gentleman with a gentleman, a lady with a lady. If that's you, let us know. If you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, if you want to put your life and influence in this church as a member, or if you need wisdom and you want to make use of this place of prayer, God has promised to answer. Father, take this time of invitation and be glorified by how we say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing and pray. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Shed his precious blood.
God rich blessings to bestow. Venge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are the all-wise God. You're never perplexed or confused. And we thank you that you give us this wisdom simply by asking. I pray we would lean hard upon thee, that we would seek after thee. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. This coming Thursday, it's hard to believe we're already in October, we have our Seniors Luncheon, Rainbow Fellowship, 55 and older. This Thursday, 10 a.m., we'll be meeting for a potluck, for a time of singing and praying, a Bible lesson this Thursday, uh, 10 a.m. I want to encourage you to come. If you're going to be available at that time, invite someone to come with you. Too many people are isolated. Too many people allow the busyness of life to keep them from fellowshipping and gathering together. And that's something that we need to do is to fellowship and encourage one another and gather together. So if you can be here, bring something to share, something to enjoy, and we'll meet this Thursday at 10 a.m. Our uh, Trunk or Treat outreach activity is coming up very soon. That will be on the 15th, and that begins at 3 p.m., and there'll be all sorts of activities for the, the kids in the community, as well as candy, gospel literature. There's a chili cook-off. How many of you like to eat chili? Oh, very good. How many of you like to make chili? All right. How many of you don't like to make chili, but because pastor is asking, you'll make some chili? Right? All right. Well, we would love to have you enter your chili in our contest. Uh, we have a chili cook-off at the end part of that day. And um, uh, Bill Johnson has promised to make a memorable chili for everybody. Amen. So, so bring, bring your Tums. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be hot. Is what he told us. It's going to be hot. It's good. Okay. It's good. You don't have to bring a hot chili. You can bring one that you will enjoy. Don't do what other people have done. And it wasn't Kathy Swarm, but don't bring in Wendy's chili. Don't bring it in and try and enter that in and win. If we find out, if we find out, um, I don't know. I think we have to call a foul on that one. But if you can decorate a trunk and give out candy, if you can bring in candy, if you can enter the chili cook-off, there's a place to sign up for that on the involvement board. Also, the ladies are having a craft activity uh, on the 14th. What time is that? Do we know? 6.30 to 9. 6.30 to 9. And they need to sign up before they come, right? Yes. And so if you can, sign up on there. What are they doing? Do we have any details? Is it secret? Is it secret? Anybody know? It's so secret that no one knows. I'm sure, I'm sure Joan knows. Joan and Cheryl will know. We'll find out. Parker, you know what it is? All right, but he's not telling us. Okay, so he's keeping that secret. Be a part of that. And then our World Mission Conference is coming up at the end of the month. That is one of the highlights of our year. There's nothing I enjoy more than when our missionary friends come in and new missionaries that we haven't yet met, and we get a chance to bless them, to hear about what God's doing in their ministries around the world. And so we have missionaries coming in from Japan, Sierra Leone. Uh, we have uh, Uganda. We have um, Brother Robinson's coming from Bearing Precious Seed. We've got uh, from Haiti with the Harrigans being with us, Disaster Relief, uh, Nehemiah's Network. Uh, the Johnsons will be here for a part of it with First Bible. So we have a, we have a lot of wonderful people coming. I forget anybody. I think that's it. So be, be a part of that. That begins on the 19th, right? Wednesday the 19th and runs through that Sunday, which I believe is the 23rd. Does that sound right? I need all this written down for me. But it's the 19th through the 23rd. Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, 7 p.m. Do all you can to be here. And then at 5 is the service project on Saturday where we, instead of just having a banquet, we will be serving and putting together some things for others uh, to give out gospel literature and show the love of Christ. And so there will be food there, but there will also be a chance for you to serve as a part of that. 
So come on that, uh, that Saturday night, and then Sunday will be our normal service times with our missionary guests alongside us. Any prayer requests? I would just say, too, if you're interested in hosting a missionary for a meal, you can sign up. In oh, yes. If you would like to host a missionary for a meal, there's a place for that. Whether you take them out or invite them into your home is totally up to you. But if you're open to doing that, we want you to get to know the missionaries and then give us feedback so that we can see where the Lord is leading and who we might choose to partner with in prayer and support. That, that would be a great blessing. Uh, yes, Jim? Amen. Mike and Pastor Jenkins, Mike Swarm, are driving down to Florida with our first uh, load of supplies. They're heading down to Tri-City Baptist Church in Port Charlotte, Florida. So pray for Tri-Cities Baptist Church. Again, how we do that, we get the supplies from here, we find a local church down there, and we help them become a connection point to give out those supplies in the gospel literature that ties the people in their community to a gospel-preaching church uh, during time of trouble in hopes that there's fruit that, that remains from all of that. Uh, wonderful news about um, uh, Debbie Gallagher. I almost just said Aunt Debbie. About Debbie Gallagher. Uh, we thought she had a stroke of some kind, but it turns out to be a complication from uh, her diabetes. And so we're praising the Lord that it, it wasn't anything that serious. Um, and so amen to that. Amen to that. Yes. Yes. Pray for uh, baby Max. This is my newest nephew. This is Sammy's third baby. He's doing well. Thank you for praying for him. He came early due to some uh, complications, but things are going well. Pray for recovery there. Yes, Ryan? Uh, people were affected by hurricane Ian. Yes, continue to pray for the hurricane victims. Absolutely. Someone I knew from Tennessee moved to Florida. And I saw his post. He said, I finally uh, have service now. We lost our home in both of our cars, but me and my wife are safe. That's what he posted. So, and I'm sure he's just one of many. Yes, pray for Rick Haney. He's dealing with kidney stones again. So ask God to give him grace. Yep, yeah, Ben? Okay, we're praying for Ben's friend Elias down in... Tennessee who has sort of a critical, serious situation. They're not sure what's going on. All right. Well, let's stand for our closing prayer. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord this evening. Pastor, it's good to, to see you with us again tonight. They've, they've freed him up a little bit from his, his preaching out there, so we get to have him and his lovely wife. Would you close us in prayer, please? Just when I need him, Jesus is near. 
Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most. Have a great evening, everybody.